Thank you, Lynn. You've had a lot of information to look at and you have it in your hands. I want to remind you that this meeting is part of a consultation process and it is not a council meeting and no decisions will be made here. And as you see, there are numbers of ways that you can give your ideas other than speaking tonight. You are being videotaped when you speak tonight and you can put your cards in. If there are groups that want to make a delegation to council, you can go on the website and look at speak to council and there's a process that you can do that as well. So the rest of this meeting is set up to have a conversation and to listen. To do both of these, we need to give the speakers a room that is listening and respect the time limits so many voices as possible can be heard. Comments and questions for clarification need to have a focus on your opinion or ideas on how these three recommendations will best serve the long-term care needs of the county now and into the future. To ensure that we as a community create this kind of meeting, we're going to adhere to the following respectful manners of speaking. Each of you, when you speak, your comments will be directed to the topic of the meeting and will be given with no raised voices, no personal attacks or accusations, no foul language, no name calling or shouting. You will be given two minutes to speak with the expectation that you will stop when your time is up. We will have two mics, Rob, you and myself will each have a mic, and we will bring the mic to you when you raise your hand. This meeting will end at nine o'clock. If you choose to speak, if you are chosen to speak, you have two minutes. And if you do not honor these respectful <coughs> manners of speaking, I will remind you that you're not doing that. If you don't stop, I will remind you again. And after, you know, the second warning, uh, then I will turn off the microphone, and if necessary, we'll uh, recess the meeting. <coughs> if people are not respectful, we will then adjourn the meeting, and the meeting will not reconvene. So this is your opportunity to respectfully give us so uh, ask your questions. Lynn and Kim are here to answer your questions and to give your opinions. And so I know that we can all do it in that way. And so we'll start now, where's Rob with the mics? And if you raise your hands, we will, we will go from one side of the room to the other and we will give you two minutes. We have somebody who's timing and she will let us know um, every two minutes. I put her under a lot of pressure tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. So, raise your hands if you have a question or a comment. Hello, um, I'm uh, Teresa O'Connor, and I'm with um, Opsu. I'm um, currently working on our We Own It campaign, which is a campaign to fight privatization. And even though we haven't used the word privatization tonight or P3s, which are public-private partnerships, even though we haven't used those words tonight, that's really what we're talking about here. When we talk about um, having a private company come in to manage the homes and ensure that there's enough workers available to do the jobs, that's privatization of that, those positions. And the, um, the um, employees right now, what I'm hearing from the presentation is that there's difficulty keeping staff, that there's, they're having to go to agencies um, to get staff. I don't see how that would be any different for a private company because a private company is looking for profit. They're not looking to, um, they're looking ways to cut corners so they can up their profits. So if they're, it, they're, they're definitely not looking to um, have long-term employees that are 
you know, paid well and, and unionized and, and doing, you know, the, the work that our, our people are doing right now. You know, they're doing a good job. We want to keep that. So my question is, I guess, um, how is privatizing the management of, of the home, how is that going to ensure that you're going to still have uh, the same quality of care for these um, elderly people, um, given given that um, you know that situation. Um, the other thing is that I wanted to make note that uh, we talked about how people want to live in their own community. Okay, so one of the things that I do know is that in most communities. This is not about privatization as far as how we operate our homes or how we deliver care or service. Currently, we purchase policies and procedures from an external company to, so that we're not spending hours trying to research, develop policy, and we can focus our intentions on providing care. So we're not talking privatization. We are looking for an external private company who provides care in a lot of homes to give us that next level to help us with our quality improvement plans to make sure we're meeting the ministry requirements for long-term care. We've seen the standards for long-term care increase huge amounts over the past few years since the implementation of the 2010 Long-Term Care Homes Act. And we're struggling every day to make sure we're meeting those requirements. We do not see that the management company would be have a magic wand and all of a sudden would be able to recruit and retain staff. That is a local problem that we need to continue to work on. Okay, so you're having issues getting staff and stuff. So I, in school, I was never told about things like nursing has a high demand and stuff like that. So why don't you educate youth on, and tr start working with the youth because the people who know about this is the seniors. So why don't you tell the youth to take nursing and as an education? That's a really great suggestion and we'll put that on the list. Put that on the list, good idea. Questions? Back here, Pat. Okay. Uh, Dan Sullivan, I've been with the uh, committee that's been trying to work with Craig County over the past 10 months to get them to see some additional data that this community here provided and why that should stay here. I'm pleased to see that you're starting to listen to some of that information and uh, understand our perspective on that. I do want to correct one thing, Lynn. I recall you saying it was 21% of the levy when you presented that one side. And I think the accurate number is 11, if my memory of the numbers are right. And that at 6.2 million, your general levy is a little over 50 million. Um, I also note that you noted Drake County has 40% of the beds in Drake, but I also recall a report that went to social services that indicated Drake County, compared to the provincial average, was spending less on long-term care than other counties. Again, I think it's a matter of making sure the information is well-rounded, all sides are being presented equally and, and fairly. The issue deserves that. Uh, I also believe the Lynn in looking at it has taken a stronger position to keeping beds in here because they've looked at the private uh, side of things. Certainly their updated report shows some of the beds that will be moving within Gray and Bruce and uh, leaving this general service area and again, that's why the beds made sense here. But my concern there is that we're still leaving our communities at the whim of private enterprise. And that's where we look to governments to provide that stability. And I believe the three homes within the triangle of Gray County, being as large a county as it is, provides a good set of bones for long-term care within Gray County service like any other, it's much like the county roads, if you take one of the bridges out of one of your communities, you destroy it for the future going forward. I see this much in the same way. Thank you very much. Lynn, would you like to respond to the numbers? Yes, I will. For the long-term care budget, 21% of our budget is 
does come from the tax levy. As part of the bigger Gray County budget, 11 cents of every tax dollar that is collected across Gray County is directed to long-term care, okay? Um, regarding the amount of money Gray County spends in comparison to other municipalities, I did go out a number of years ago and it was really difficult to compare apples to apples. Each municipality charges or contributes certain costs towards long-term care and certain capital. It's how they do their back um, accounting. You know, are computer costs charged to long-term care or are they not? Some of those things, it was really hard to identify. And at that time, the um, idea was that we were about the middle of the pack. We weren't spending the least and we weren't spending the most. But at this time, we do know that 40% of the beds in Gray County are operated by the municipality. Thanks, Lynn. You have a question? Yes, I do. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just wonder uh, why we don't just say no. Uh, quite frankly, if I take a look at the big picture in the small towns, downing schools and now doing away with um, senior residents, it's, I'm starting to get a picture that they want to just squash small towns. Why don't we just get our big pants on and say no? If I could, I will just go back to one point that, that Lynn made in her presentation, and I think it's really important for all of us to do our best to understand the context that we're working in. Long-term care is a high, highly regulated service that is controlled by the province through the LIN. The province looks at the supply of long-term care beds on a system-wide basis. And as Lynn showed you on the slide, Gray County has been very blessed with one of the highest supplies of long-term care beds in the province. When you looked at that slide and you saw places, high population places, like Halton and Peel, town of Milton, with a, a well over a third less supply of long-term care beds than we do. And we all, I think, are aware of the fiscal situation that the province finds itself in. I think we have to consider carefully that there may be some c competition in the system. And we need to do our best to work together to develop a proposal that the land and the province will ultimately support. Because at the end of the day, whatever comes out of all of our deliberations, whatever that final recommendation is, it is but a recommendation by the County of Gray to the Lynn and to the province. We are not decision makers at the end of all of this. So we do we need have to work with those folks and we do need to make sure that we're putting the strongest case together to demonstrate why it is that we're doing what we're doing. Throughout all of this, I think it's been really clear, we want to hang on to uh, these 166 beds in South Gray. Mm -hmm. That's the key. So putting together the two facilities in one, and we've talked about some of the reasons for that, but fundamentally, what we're trying to do is ensure that there is no loss of those beds. When Lynn talked to council, and some of you were there at that presentation, we also gave some information there about timelines and where we are. That Rockwood Terrace license is up in 2025. And that's the deadline that we need to meet for redevelopment. But prior to getting to that final deadline, there are other deadlines in the process where the province can say, hmm, it seems to me perhaps you're not moving forward here. And they may decide that they want to take another decision. So they have the ability in, and do with all long-term care homes to speak within that last five years of your license to be able to say, we're not going to continue with this. So we are very astute, very conscious of that. And so again, I'm just trying to, to, there's a very broad picture here beyond our own individual communities. And <clears throat> we just want to make sure that, you know, 
I think our best case is one where we go forward together. Okay, other questions? Uh, I have one here. Thank you, Pat. I understand you're on the horns of a dilemma. <clears throat> but I understand that. But my first question is, the statistics you've used for future growth, is it as flawed as the Watson report was of your school closing? The county undertakes a growth management study every five years, so we do have our own statistics, and we're trying to um, be as sophisticated as we can about what those numbers actually mean. We know that in parts of Gray County, not only do we have permanent residents, but we also have um, second homes and people who may be making decisions at some point in their life, either to make that second home their permanent home or folks that may be moving back to um, the city, if I can use that term, um, because that's where their family is. That was part of the um, assistance that um, CBRE gave to us because that's their business is really um, understanding the, some of the details around that. Certainly any kind of population projections is a bit of a dark art and it's again all of our jobs to look really critically at those numbers and ensure that we all believe in what they say and that it makes sense and we're trying to do that. One more question. Yes, thank you. That was good. Um, one of my other things is when are the school boards or the counties going to take on the lens who are set up to divide and conquer when it came to the provincial government so they get their way and we don't have a say? I don't, uh, you know what, the, the Lynn has been very, um, yeah, they've been great to work with. Every question that we've asked, they've come back and, and worked with us. I can't speak for the school board, and this is not a, an education meeting, but certainly the Lynn from a system planning perspective and as, as somebody who would help us, um, give us more information, help us to get to a meeting with the Ministry of Health so we can try to state the case for why rural Ontario and Gray County um, deserve to be looked at a little bit differently. I can't say enough good about how they tried to help us. Thank you. Other questions? Hi. I see by your projection about uh, how, how you're stepping up for the seniors, but according to Ontario.ca, the Ministry of Senior Affairs <coughs> say that by the next 25 years, the population of seniors is going to double from 2.2 million to 4.4 million. So how are you setting up uh, the West Gray, uh, the Gray County area for all those seniors? Because not all of them will just stay home. They need uh, help. They need uh, uh, um, more care. So how are you going to set up that one? The ministry recognizes it as a challenge, and we do as well. What we have heard from the ministry, loud and clear, there are no new long-term care beds at this time. So that we can't change. What we can support is maintaining the beds that we have in this area and doing the best we can with them. Part of this plan was to look and say, what is the area of service that is missing for our seniors in South Bray? And that's assisted living, memory care, and seniors' apartments. That's a gap. And only 10% of seniors or people over the age of 75 are anticipated to need long-term care. So by having that huge gap, there's a lot of people out there that will not get care. Does it sound right? <laughs> Other questions?
first question is there a St. John ambulance person here? Because after I speak, that probably is me. <laughs> anyway, um, I, this is not a question. It's Great Gables is a class A, so why would you have to close it? I think the majority of the people want to see it stay open. And if you need to build something else here, Rockwood Terrace, that is fine. Now, my question is, when you become a counselor or you become a CEO, is there not something in a book somewhere that says that there's something that you have to adhere to, like listening to the people or managing our money? And because we're not happy with the way um, these presentations are being brought forth and the things that we want are different than what you do, um, I'm not sure you're doing that, but there has to be something there somewhere that says you need to listen to the people and you need to protect our money. And I've heard a lot of people say Gray Gables, if sold, is going to be sold for way under what it's really worth. I hope by having this meeting <clears throat> and by being here with you, Lynn and I are demonstrating our commitment to listen and to hear what you have to say. I, I can't be any more genuine than I am. I really do care, and I really do want to get to a place that can help our elected officials make the best possible decision, because that's our job, is just to provide the best information for them. They're the ultimate decision makers here. With regard to um, financial stewardship and our, and our duty to protect the interest there are 93,000 people living in Gray County, um, 54,000, I think, households in Gray County that, play, that, that pay taxes. And we're very conscious of the fact that in this big geography, and you're trying to you know, make sure that this continuum of service is available to everyone that needs it. We know... Um, what it cost to, to build Great Gables at the beginning. We know what the valuation is that, that has been suggested to us for that facility. And certainly we'll be completely open and transparent with council about that, about where those numbers take us. Like any real estate transaction, if, it, if that is in fact the direction that we go, you're never going to have 100% certainty until you go to the market. But the one thing I can tell you is the recommendation as it's worded is one where we're um, suggesting that we go forward with an expression of interest that we would like to be able to evaluate people's proposals for how they'd like to use the, um, the facility um, within that assisted living memory care thing we are in no way suggesting that it would be appropriate or correct to simply put a for sale sign at the end of the driveway and see who happened along. But we have no intention of recommending that to council, nor do I think they would ever let us do that. Questions? Other questions? <laughs> Just one person and then. I just wanted to know if there was an impact study done on for the town of Durham and the town of, of Markdale and see how this would affect them all. Has that study been done? Or if, if so, when? And if not, when is it going to be? So an economic impact. Mm -hmm. You're recommending that they do one. You're recommending that one of those gets done. I can, I can speak to that. Certainly that was raised earlier in the process. Did, would we do an economic impact study? It didn't seem like an, an appropriate um, direction to take when we didn't have an option on the table to be discussed. And certainly that's something that has been raised in the past and something that may well come back at the council table. If council so directs staff that they'd like to have that next level of detail undertaken or they feel that there's some value 
here in, in doing that work, then by all means, that's what we will be doing. I'm going to thank Mark and my wife, Margaret. We've been here for 17 years. We've had three parents go through Rockwood Terrace here to our heart. Uh, closing this facility down affects a great number of people, not only at Rockwood Terrace, at our hospitals, nurses, doctors, pharmacies, not to mention the number of small businesses. And we've been here 17 years and we've seen businesses come and go. It's, it's kind of disheartening sometimes to see things closing down. I think we should be moving ahead. And uh, so uh, that was that's one of the comments I had. And, and losing uh, Rockford Terrace would mean losing hardworking, caring, committed people that are a tremendous asset to our community. And I've, I've got to know a lot of them on a first name basis that work there because of our parents being there. Great bunch of people. I, I, in fact, I tried to get a bed there myself, lined up. <laughs> I like them so much. Uh, we have enough empty businesses, uh, establishments, city empty as it is in Durham. We have enough that even some of them should be knocked down at this point. Uh, the more businesses uh, leave, the more our property value goes down on our houses. Renovations can, can, uh, can prove. I've been a builder for 50 years. Renovations can prove uh, to be cost effective uh, more than building a new, uh, in certain, building new in certain incidences and uh, hiring local contractors, subcontractors, and suppliers, keeping the funds <coughs> around our own court. That's just my comments. Thank you. For your comments and part of this plan is to keep the beds in our communities and also offer an opportunity for future development in um, Grey Highland. I'm Mike Farrell. Uh, my wife and I have lived in this community for some 35 years. Uh, I, I feel for you guys because the decision isn't yours either. And I don't know whether you're just here to see how mad we're going to get when you make the wrong decision. Uh, it seems ironic to me that the, the talk of selling Grey Gables would even enter into it because the, the government will not allow a multimillionaire to help them run a public school. So where this, where this public-private plan is coming from, I don't know. And I'm a little offended by pie charts financial pie charts. Everybody in this room, everybody in this room pays municipal, county, provincial, and federal taxes. It's all our money. And it's not being taken by the federal. Um, the Auditor General is the person who looks at uh, the provincial finances and tells us, you know, whether our money is being spent properly. And um, the last report stated that the province overspent $8.3 billion in private-public partnerships. That's $8.3 million more. And my question is, if the government hadn't overspent the 8.3 billion more, do you think that would have been enough money to service our seniors properly in this area? That would be a good question for the Auditor General, I think. <laughs>